Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to A Pathway to Multi-Tenancy in Kubernetes. So today we're gonna to talk about best practices, guidelines, and features and tools that you might want to employ in order to get towards a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster, okay? Uh, I have a lot of slides to talk about today, uh, so most likely uh, the questions will end up um, after the talk outside the door, okay? Uh, my name is Paul Sidowitz. I work for Capital One. I'm a software development engineering manager and developer. Um, I have a little more than 28 years of experience building software. Uh, more recently, over the last couple of years, I've focused more on containerization and Kubernetes. Uh, work, got my uh, certifications. Um, currently, I'm supporting a fraud decisioning platform for retail banking within Capital One that has run in production on Kubernetes since early 2017, and that's using Kubernetes version 1.4. Okay, long time ago. Uh, I'm also a lead content creator and lead instructor for the Capital One Tech College Kubernetes Instructor-Led Training, or KILT, series of courses. So I do a lot of training, and Kubernetes uh, is definitely big. You know, there's a lot of adoption happening within the industry. Capital One is no different. Uh, in fact, lots of initiatives going on, so the training is definitely uh, very useful. Um, for those that are, would like a little bit more details regarding the um, fraud decisioning platform that I've supported for the last few years, you can go to Kubernetes.io, uh, case studies, whoops, I guess this, my, uh, my thing is not quite working. Okay, so case studies are Capital One. Um, it is the only Capital One case study on Kubernetes.io, so you shouldn't be able to miss that, okay? So a little bit about my slides and titles, right? So I use breadcrumb-based slide titles. And the idea is to be able to provide a trail for the user to follow back to the start of an ancestor topic, and which help to provide the necessary overall context for a slide. So when you're looking at a slide within the grand scheme of the presentation, you know exactly where you are at any given point in time. So examples include, for instance, say we start off with a pathway to multi-tenancy in K8s. Then we jump down to self-healing under multi-tenancy. And then under self-healing, we go to container probes. And we talk about liveness under container probes, and we switch to readiness under container probes. Notice how it's changing. And finally, back up to container probes. And then under self-healing, we switch to auto-scaling, and then up to namespace isolation. So looking at the titles give you an idea of where you are within the grand scheme of the presentation. Now, for your information, I will make myself available outside the session room for extended Q&A immediately after this talk is over for a short while. Okay. So first, let's talk a little bit about agenda. In the introduction, talk a little bit about what I'll be presenting. And then some heartache and pain points of multi-tenant K8s. We'll cover some definitions, workloads, containerized workload, pod controller managers, multi-tenancy, and then some assumptions about you. And then we'll jump into multi-tenancy and Kubernetes clusters, what it's all about, when it is a concern, what degree is required, some pros and cons, and then we jump into a pathway to multi-tenancy in K8s. We'll cover key building blocks, self-healing, namespace isolation, resource limitation, node isolation, security limitation, network policy isolation, and open policy agent. And then finally, we'll do some summary and takeaways. Okay? So introduction. So building large-scale distributed software is not easy especially when you must support multiple tenants, and each have their own workloads to run and SLAs to meet. Compute and storage resources are limited and need to be shared, okay? So careful thought must be given to ensure that resource isolation is obtained to help address resource contention and avoid starvation, okay? So really ensuring that you properly employ the right features and strategies to keep your workloads well managed is critical. Right? So heartache and pain points of Kubernetes, multi-tenant Kubernetes. Coordinated deployments may be necessary between tenants. Cluster version baseline up through the add-on stack. Essentially what that means is all tenants have to use the same version of the Kubernetes control plane. Right? There's concerns of resource servation and resource contention. Thundering herd, cascading failures, administrative blindness, due to log and metric forwarder saturation. So how do we avert tragedy of the commons? Well, unfortunately, there is no such thing as a self-tuning, self-administrating Kubernetes cluster, unfortunately. But fortunately, there are several Kubernetes features that we can use 
as the key ingredients in our recipe for operating a well-managed, multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. And these features, as most of you are probably familiar with, namespaces, container lifecycle hooks, your probes, liveness and readiness, pod resource requests and limits, limit ranges, resource quotas, auto-scaling secrets, security context, pod security policies, role-based access control, network policies, taints tolerations, and affinity and anti-affinity. Right? But first, we'll start off with a couple of definitions, so we're well-grounded. Right? Workload. So it's an application that performs some work or processing requires CPU and memory resources. Right? This could be a server or a daemon, can be batched or scheduled jobs. The idea is it usually refers to anything that is run by a tenant as a service. Okay? And we have containerized workload. That's a workload that is packaged as a Docker image and run inside of a Docker container. And it's created from a Docker image, likely downloaded from an image registry. And to note, you know, within Kubernetes, you have your pods, which are the smallest unit for deploying a containerized workload. Okay? Pod controllers and managers. So these are going to consist of our higher level Kubernetes resource objects, which have corresponding controllers and are used to manage pods, typically to maintain a desired count of pod replicas. And the more common ones are your deployments, which manage replica sets, which in turn manage pods, daemon sets for maintaining on one replica per node, jobs for your batch-oriented type of workloads, cron jobs for batch-oriented, but to follow perhaps a Unix cron scheduling um, feature, stateful sets for your stateful workloads, replica sets, which are minus zero more pods and are leveraged by your deployments, okay? So typically you won't be working with those directly. And then the replication controller, which was replaced by the replica set. Okay. Now, as a best practice, these should always be used in production instead of individual pods. Okay. So multi-tenancy. A tenant is a group of users who share a common access with specific privileges to a software instance. Now, the term software multi-tenancy refers to a software architecture in which a single instance of software runs on a server and serves multiple tenants. Okay? So multi-tenant systems are often called shared, in contrast to dedicated or isolated. Thundering herd, when a large number of processes waiting for an event are awoken, but only one process is able to handle the event. After all the processes wake up, they will start to handle the event, but only one will win. All processes will compete for resources, possibly causing throttling, CPU of course, until the herd is calmed down again. Tragedy of the commons. So this is a situation where resources in a shared resource system are depleted due to the collective action of independent tenants acting according to their own self-interest. Maybe not intentional, but the end result is that we end up, everyone uses as many resources as they would like, okay? And that won't scale. So some assumptions about you. You're familiar with Docker and Kubernetes. You're interested in learning about addressing multi-tenancy concerns in Kubernetes. You will silence your phones during the presentation. Thank you. You will hold off on questions until after the end of the presentation. Thanks in advance for your compliance. Much appreciated. Okay, so multi-tenancy in Kubernetes clusters. So what is it all about? Really hosting disparate workloads owned by more than one user on the same shared Kubernetes cluster. Right? It's effectively addressing shared resources and contention concerns by leveraging specific Kubernetes features and recommended guidelines for what maintaining well-managed workloads. Okay? It's also about ensuring proper isolation of running workloads and employing security policies and features to control and limit access to only those resources that a given user should have access to use. Okay? And really, in a nutshell, it's all about making it safe for multi-tenant workloads to coexist in the same cluster. So when is it a concern? Well, when workloads negatively impact other workloads by perhaps consuming too many resources and causing resource starvation. Failing to control blast radius when components fail and bring down other components. Accessing or using components that they should not have access to. Using the cluster without the proper safeguards in place to promote safe sharing. 
So what degree of multi-tenancy is required? Well, is it acceptable to use the same control plane components for multiple tenants? Is it acceptable to use the same physical worker nodes for hosting multiple tenant workloads together? Is it acceptable to use non-encrypted secrets in transit at rest? Is it acceptable for all the workloads to invoke your services and or be invoked? Is it necessary and justified to have a separate cluster per tenant? These are all the things that come into mind. Okay? So with multi-tenancy, there are usually some pros and cons. On the pro side, usually more cost effective, okay? running a single cluster. It's easier to share common components, and it is easier to manage a single cluster. On the con side, however, resource contention and starvation, unless you utilize and employ the right features to prevent that. Component sharing can degrade performance or impact SLAs, things to be mindful of. It is hard to get right. There is really no silver bullet. So what should we do? Let's begin our journey by following a pathway to multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Right? So the overview. We're going to start with our key building blocks. These will be robust and tested container images, pod controllers and managers, and we move on to self-healing including container lifecycle hooks, liveness probes, readiness probes, and auto-scaling. We move on to namespace isolation and resource request and limitation. The idea is separate namespace or spaces per tenant. Pod resource requests and limits should be employed, use of limit ranges and resource quotas. For pod node isolation, pain and tolerations, pod affinity and anti-infinity. Security limitation, security context, pod security policies, secrets, role-based access control, and then network policy isolation to control network ingress and egress communication between pods. All of these combined, used wisely, help you maintain a well-managed multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. So let's take a closer look at this in more detail. Okay? So first we start off with our key building blocks. Right? So really we should always use robust and tested container images, right? So the pathway to multi-tenancy starts with the container image itself. Your images should be tested for performance and quality. You should identify ideal workload resource requests and limits. Now this is not, there's no silver bullet to this. This takes a lot of practice, testing and time to find the right sweet spots, okay? You should use automation for repeatable and consistent ongoing testing. CI, CD will be your best friend, okay? Artifacts needed to build images should be version control. Never deploy to production an image with tag latest. How, you know, think about doing rollbacks, right? That'll be a little more difficult. Uh, always use a secure image registry. And try to limit your image size whenever possible, okay? On the key building blocks, we also have our pod controllers and managers, okay? So you should never deploy a single k pod to production. Because really, unmanaged pods are not resilient. Someone comes along and delays your pod, there's no manager managing it, it's gone. You have a controller managing it, spins up another replica. Okay? You should never use, you should, you should instead use, not never, you should instead use pod controller managers like your deployments and daemon sets for stateless workloads, jobs and cron jobs for your batch-oriented workloads, and stateful sets for your stateful workloads. And we move on to self-healing, okay? So within self-healing, you know, sooner or later software applications are going to fail. I've never met a piece of software without a bug. Okay? I don't think that exists. The self-healing software can identify that it is not operating correctly and without human intervention can take action to restore itself to normal operation. And the whole idea is something goes wrong at two o'clock in the morning, you're on call. It would be nice if the system just got over the issue and you know, restored itself without you having to get up in the middle of the night. And that's really what we're striving for. Okay. So K8 pods need help to enable self-healing through the use of liveness and readiness probes. Okay. Auto-scaling can help to keep the system responsive and healthy under heavy loads. And operation costs down when system load decreases. So for self-healing, we're gonna jump into and talk about container probes, 
right? So when you implement your container probes, there are three types of implementations that you can use, right? First would be your command. And the idea is executing a specified command inside the container. And that would be successful if the command exits with a status code of zero. Now, this is your typical Unix, Linux uh, status code conventions, okay? Now, one thing to be mindful of, make sure the command that you are trying to run is baked into your Docker image, okay? So TCP, perform a TCP check against container's IP address on a specified port, okay? This is considered successful if the port is open. Finally, HTTP for your web-based applications, right? And the idea is you can perform an HTTP GET request against a container's IP address on a specified port and path, okay? This is considered successful if the HTTP status code return is within the range of 200 to 400, okay? Meaning the probe would succeed. So now we get into the probes themselves. And there are two types of container probes that are available to us, right? First, we have our liveness probes, and we have our readiness probes. So first, we're going to talk about liveness probes. They enable pod containers to recover from a broken state by being restarted. The idea is that when you start an application, usually when it comes up the first time, it's in a good state. Now, there may be issues like leaks and whatnot that eventually will get it to a bad state. So the idea is, if we identify it's in a bad state, have the container be restarted to put you back in a good state. Okay? That's really what it's all about. And with these probes, you can define periodic checks to determine if a pod container is alive. And if it is not, then it is killed and restarted from a good state, hopefully. Okay? Now, without liveness probes, K8 Kubernetes is truly blind and unaware that your workloads may have silently failed or stopped working. Okay? From a Kubernetes perspective, everything looks great. From the application, it may be dead. Okay? So you need something to help figure that out. So a simple little example of a liveness probe. You know, here in the live, that's oh, not working, in the liveness probe, where essentially what it'll do is it'll create a file on a volume called temp healthy. And for the thir first 30 seconds, periodically, the probe will run successfully. And then what we do is we remove that file and cause it to trigger the liveness probe to repeatedly fail after it runs every five seconds for the next 10 minutes. In addition to liveliness, there's readiness probes, okay? And they allow containers to indicate that they are not ready and therefore should temporarily not receive traffic. Now, typically, these are for front-facing applications with a user interface, you know, where perhaps, you know, the back-end pods, containers are not available. And so you don't want requests to hit that pod and cause confusing messages and confusing states. So the idea is that, you know, so you have your periodic checks to determine if the container is ready or not. And if it's not, then it will stop Re, it'll stop receiving traffic until it safely can. Now, this is enforced by the endpoint IPs for your pods automatically being removed so that they will not receive traffic for services that they support. This is something that happens automatically. But you have to have readiness probes. Okay? Now, when a pod transitions back to readiness, it'll automatically resume traffic, receiving traffic, without any intervention. This is a really nice feature. So really, without readiness probes, Kubernetes will send traffic to unready pods, and this can cause failures and unexpected results. Don't forget your probes. Okay? Simple container probe that's basically going to do a TCP check, and this actually also has a liveness probe as well. Okay? You can definitely have both of those. So container probes in general, if your workload requires time to properly start up and initialize then you want to be sure to include an appropriate value for your initial delay seconds property on your probe, or else it may always fail when run. Okay, so really, don't start running your probes until your containers are initialized and ready to do processing and receive traffic. Okay, that's really the takeaway. Container lifecycle hooks. Okay. So the idea here is to enable containers to be aware of events in their management lifecycle and run code implemented in a handler when a corresponding lifecycle hook is executed. Okay? Now, this is important to enable pod containers to perform necessary initialization and cleanup tasks when pod container is created or deleted. Okay? So there are two hooks 
that are exposed to containers. First, you have your post start hook, all right? And this is executed immediately after a container is created. However, there is no guarantee that the hook will execute before the container entry point. So you want to make sure you implement your container entry point appropriately without assuming that the post start will be invoked first. Then we have a pre-stop. The idea for this is to be called immediately before a container is terminated. And essentially it gives it, you know, the time to perform tasks to properly clean up resources used by an application container. Usually, you know, to be able to gracefully shut down. Okay, um, you don't want some uh, apps. You don't want to start, stop, you know, cold. You want to give it a chance to uh, shut down gracefully. And pre-stop is your way to get to that. Now, be sure the pod's termination grace period is configured long enough to allow your pre-stop handler to complete gracefully. Because it would kind of suck if, you know, basically your pod exits the containers go away before you finish doing that cleanup code, and you end up, you know, wasting and um, you, you know, resources and, and whatnot, okay? So hook handler implementations support two types, and it's similar to probes we talked about earlier without the TCP option. So really, you're going to have an exec to be able to execute a command in a container, and then you also have HTTP for your web-based applications, okay? Execute an HTTP request, okay? Simple little life cycle, life cycle hook example. We have a post start that simply out executes a message and writes it to a file on the, writable, um, on the writable layer within the Docker image. And then finally, for the pre-stop, what it looks like it's doing is it's running Nginx with some options to gracefully shut down Nginx properly. Okay, and this is a good example of why you might want to use your lifecycle hooks. Next, within self-healing, we move on to auto-scaling. All right, so the idea is you want to scale out when system load is heavy, create more resources to handle the load, and then scale in when system load is light. Okay. There are three supported types of auto-scaling within Kubernetes. First, we have horizontal. And with horizontal, what we're interested in is the increase and decrease in the number of replicas. What kind of replicas? Well, it depends. If we're talking about pods, then we want to use the horizontal pod auto-scale, and we're talking about creating additional pod replicas or removing pod replicas, okay? Scale the number of pod replicas for a specified pod manager controller automatically. And the idea is to, you can configure it to scale your pods based on custom, multiple, or even external metrics. And this will require a metric server add-on to be running, right? Simple little walkthrough. Here we're creating a deployment. And then we're creating um, a horizontal pod autoscaler, which says when CPU hits 50 and above, then you know, have it either increase or decrease the number of uh, replicas um, between 1 and 10. Okay? With horizontal, you can also scale nodes. Okay? And when I mean nodes, we're talking about worker nodes, where your containers are going to be running. And for that, we have the cluster autoscaler. So the idea is to automatically add new worker nodes when resource request sizes exceed the remaining resource sizes across all the nodes in the cluster. You run out of space, spin up a new node. That new node is not needed. It gets spun down. Okay? Automatically remove the nodes when resource usage dips below a specified threshold limit. Okay? So the cluster size will adjust up and down within a specified min and max range that you've defined. Now, one thing to note, procedure to enable cluster auto-scaling is different for every cloud provider. They do it slightly different, okay? And the other thing to note is, unlike, you know, your basic metrics and whatnot, the cluster auto-scaler takes into account actual just resource requests and limits. It doesn't look at CPU, memory, GPU usage. It's only looking at requests and limits, okay? Finally, that leads us to the last type of auto-scaling, and that is, of course, vertical. And the idea with vertical is we want to increase or decrease in resource usage for a running pod, perhaps increasing the amount of memory and the amount of CPU that the containers are using. Okay? On the, and this is supported via your, pod, your vertical pod autoscaler. Okay? And it requires a pod container restart for changes to requests and our limits to take effect. 
So in our journey, we're now looking at namespace isolation. Okay. So by default, all resources in Kubernetes are created in a default namespace. Right? And namespaces can be used to scope resource names and can specify constraints for resource consumption to prevent pods from running with unbounded CPU and memory request limits, which by default they will do. By default, you deploy something, it'll try and use all of the resources on a worker node, unless you prevent it. Okay? Resources created in one namespace are hidden from other namespaces. So for best practices, really you want to put tenant resources in corresponding and separate namespaces. Now you may have one or more namespaces corresponding to a single tenant, and that's fine. Okay? So with your namespace isolation, one of the best practices are to always label your namespaces, and you'll see why shortly. The idea is so that they can be used by network policies to control network and ingress and egress, an entire namespace. Okay. So now we move along to resource limitation. Okay. So resource limitation. We're talking about container requests and limits. Now, now these are usually set by an application developer in their pod specifications. Right. It's specified for each container in a pod. Pod resource requests and limits are the sum of all resource request limits for each container. Okay. Now, the requests themselves will help the scheduler to be smarter about scheduling based on declared resource requests for workloads. Okay. Here's a simple little example where we're defining some memory limits directly within the pod spec. Um, and we can see that the requests are less than the limit, which means there's the opportunity for it to grow and use more memory. Okay? CPU, on the other hand, same thing. We're, we're configuring uh, the limits and the requests so that it's what we call burstable, and we'll see what that's about very shortly. Okay? So why are resource requests important? Well, they ensure that the minimum required resources are available. Okay? And the scheduler bases its decisions only on allocable resource amounts, those being the resource requests that you defined. Well, why are resource limits important? Well, they define the maximum allowed value for a resource. Without limits, a pod can consume as many resources as it likes and can potentially starve other workloads. This is the default behavior. Okay? Exceeding memory limits may cause a pod to out of memory killed, be out of memory killed. And of course, exceeding CPU limits essentially will uh, cause it to be throttled. Okay? That's usually um, the, way, the symptoms. So with container requests and limits, this leads us to something called quality of service classes, QOSs. Okay? And quality of service classes are not things that you explicitly set. They're derived by setting other resources, properties, okay? So they're used to determine the priority order for which workloads will be killed first when the system needs to reclaim memory for higher priority, priority workloads, okay? So it requires that resource requests and or limits are specified. So on the highest quality of service, we have our guaranteed. In order to achieve guaranteed quality of service, what you want to do is set the request size and the limits to be exactly the same, okay? You go down a little bit lower in quality of service, you can achieve burstable. And with burstable, which is some of the examples that we, we saw earlier, the request size is less than the limit size, meaning it has room to grow and burst. That's why they call it burstable, okay? And finally, if you do not provide any request or limits, then the quality of service class will be the lowest, and this is best effort. Now, the thing to understand with these quality of service classes, if you have a class that's running as best effort, okay, and there is no more room on any of the worker nodes uh, to deploy new workloads, okay, and you don't have a cluster auto scaler running, if you def deploy a best effort, right, if you have that best effort running, and someone comes along and deploys um, 
essentially they're guaranteed quality of service and there are no resources available, your pod running at best effort may be preempted, killed to make room for that higher quality of service um, pod to be deployed. Okay? This can happen. You should design for this. Expect it's going to happen. Okay? Limit ranges. Right? So these are usually created by a cluster administrator, and they're used to enforce the minimum and maximum compute resource usage per pod or container in a namespace as defined by the namespace's resource quota. Right? They enforce minimum and maximum storage requests per persistent volume claim in a namespace. Okay? And another thing that they do, which is very useful, is set default request limits for compute resources in a namespace and automatically inject them to containers at runtime if they are not specified in a pod, container spe in a pod specification. Okay? These will constrain container request limits specified in a pod spec. So, you know, the idea is you don't want to just let anyone deploy workloads to consume as many resources as they want. They have to be, there have to be guardrails to prevent anyone from deploying something like that, and limited ranges are one level of guardrails. Okay? Here's an example where we're constraining, we're, we're actually defining constraints and defaults for each container. Okay? The max memory and the min memory. And then down here, we're also um, configuring the total aggregated constraints for each pod. Okay, now you could see that the container max is one gig and the pod max is one gig. Essentially, what all of this means is for that type of pod, you'll never be able to create more than one container. Okay, and that's essentially what you've added with that limit range. CPU, very similar, uh, except you're setting CPU. Constraints and defaults for each container. Resource quotas, right? So these are usually created by a cluster administrator as well, right? And what they do is they support configuring your limits for the number of types of Kubernetes resources that can be created within a namespace, including aggregate resource totals across all workloads in a namespace, okay? And it can even be used to disallow the usage of a given resource within the namespace by setting the number of allowed resources for a type to zero, okay? Now, thing to note is resource quotas. These will constrain your container request limits set in your pod specifications, and they will also limit what you can do within limit ranges, okay? So there's different layers of constraints. Here's an example of a resource quota. And you can see we're disallowing um, you know, anyone to use lo uh, load balancer services, uh, limiting the number of pods to five. So this is a way of constraining a number of objects that could actually be created within the namespace. You can also configure the aggregate resource constraints across all pods in the namespace. So if I was to read that, essentially what that tells me is for a given namespace that I use this resource quota for across all the pod containers, you cannot use any more than 600 millicores across them all, okay? And that's how your resource quotas work. Now, if resource requests and limits are specified, then each pod that the quota applies to must also define resource requests and limits. So really a common practice is to always define default requests and limits via limit range to satisfy the above requirement. Node isolation, okay, next thing in our multi-tenancy journey. So workloads are scheduled to run on worker nodes, also called minions, right? So by default, multi-tenant workloads can and will be scheduled to run on the same worker nodes and forced to shared resources. That is, unless you explicitly prevent them from doing so, perhaps as required. Let's take a closer look at this in more detail. All right, so taints and tolerations. These may be used as a way of preventing pods from being scheduled to and or executed on specified nodes, okay? And the idea is here is to only allow tolerated workloads on specific nodes, specify nodes to enforce isolation. Perhaps maybe what you want to do is you want to limit the use of specialized nodes with features like GPUs, perhaps, 
that are critical to certain workloads and prevent usage of these other workloads, prevent the usage by other workloads. Okay, so premium um, resources on the nodes, you don't want just any workload running. Okay? So with your taints, you have a key value and effect to prevent scheduling or execution of a pod on a node unless it tolerates the taint. So essentially, it's a flexible way to keep pods away from nodes or evict those that shouldn't be running there. And the idea is you would taint the node, the name of your node, specifying a key, and then some kind of effect, no schedule, don't schedule it to the node, or no execute, evict it from a node if it's already running there at the time the taint is created. Okay? And it turns out that the node controller will automatically taint nodes with certain conditions um, are true. Okay? And this can be useful if you needed to uh, react to any of these type of events, okay? So along with your taints, you have your tolerations, right? And so really, toleration also has a key, a value, and an effect that matches a taint if the keys are the same and the effects are the same, okay? It allows a pod to be scheduled and or executed on a tainted node. So essentially what we have there is a it's a whole bunch of tolerations, the keys and the values and the effects should match a taint, okay? Uh, without tolerations, you, you, not, you cannot deploy, schedule, or have something run on a tainted node, okay? So did you know that when you're using kubeadm installs, master nodes are tainted so that only internal Kubernetes resources could run on them? Now this works since only the Kubernetes internal resources usually define a matching toleration in their pod specifications. Of course, there's nothing to stop us from using the same tolerations in our own uh, workloads, right? Um, one thing to note, you know, if you're deploying like, you know, single node clusters where you're running a master and a worker together and you're using kubeadm, you may need to remove the taints if you're using one single node for your Kubernetes components and your application workloads, okay? So pod isolation, right? So even when deploying workloads for a single tenant, it may be desirable to prefer some pods to be scheduled and run together while others should not be. So for an example, perhaps we're deploying multiple replicas of uh, a staple resource like Kafka which consumes an enormous amount of resources. And you do not want more than one replica scheduled to the same node for obvious reasons so that there may be contention, okay? So we can use pod anti-affinity to help us enforce the above deployment policy, all right? So affinity, draw pods towards a node based on other pods already running there. Anti-affinity? push pods away from a node based on other pods already running there, okay? So, allow you to constrain which node your pod is eligible to be scheduled on. Based on labels, on pods that are already running on the node rather than based on labels on the node itself, okay? So we're talking about based on pod labels. And it does support a topology key which can also match a node label, right? So for affinity, allows a pod to run on a node if the node is already running one or more specified pods. So you want to draw pods to those. Anti-affinity, you want to prevent your pods from running on a node if the node is already running one or more specified pods. If Kafka is already running, do not deploy Kafka to the same worker node, okay? Here's a, an example using pod anti-affinity. In a nutshell, essentially what this anti-affinity rule is going to define is it's going to do not allow Kafka pods to be scheduled to a node already running another Kafka pod. Good example of using anti-affinity, right? Next, we move on to security limitation, okay? So container security can be used to secure the container file system and enable, disable privilege actions and access to host machine kernel features, okay? Security context and pod security policies are the Kubernetes features available for this, right? Network security can be used to control ingress. Network's policies can be used to um, control ingress, egress, connectivity between pods, right? Your network policies are the Kubernetes 
object to support that feature. We also have role-based access control. This is a, an approach to restricting system access to authorized users. RBAC, role-based access control, is the feature available in Kubernetes for this. Let's take a closer look at these in more detail. So first, security contexts. The idea with a security context define privilege and access control settings for a pod and or a container as defined inside a pod specification. Can be defined within a pod specification and or within each container running inside of a pod. Each of your containers can have different security contexts. You can have one at the pod level that they all leverage. Defining at the container layer, however, will override one defined at the pod layer. Okay? And this can be overridden at a higher level by security context rules inside of a pod security policy. The idea is, now anyone can define a security context in their pod specifications, right? And likewise, there's no reason why someone can't, you know, escalate to root permissions. Perhaps for your cluster, you may not want workloads assuming um, root access, you know, essentially giving them access to do just about anything in the cluster. So really what an administrator can do is deploy a pod security policy to constrain what can be done at the pod specifications within the security context, okay? So here's an example of security context, first at the pod layer. And what this will do is it will ensure that the container will be ran as user with the ID of 1,000, okay? On the other hand, we have a container layer. And what the container layer does is it overrides the pod layer. It will run this container as user 2,000, and it's going to explicitly disallow privilege escalation, right? So pod security policies after the context. These are cluster-level resources that control security-sensitive aspects of the pod specification, okay? They define a set of conditions that a pod must run with in order to be accepted into the system. Now, these are usually created by a cluster administrator, and you can override security settings configured by a pod security context, and that's why this feature is there, okay? As a guardrail against security context, run, run amok. Secrets. These are objects used to hold sensitive data, things like passwords, tokens, keys. They are base64 encoded, not encrypted, so that they can handle binary type of characters. It's safer and more flexible than putting in an image or pod definition, right? Reduces the risk of accidental exposure, okay? And the idea is they're mounted, used by pods to inject sensitive data that your workloads may need. Example of uh, secrets, we're defining a secret and then a pod to consume them. In this example, we're defining a secret with a username and password. Note how they are base64 encoded. And then finally, we have the secret reference where within the pod, it's going to reference the exact secret that it's going to mount or use. Okay? Now, secrets may be encrypted at rest to ensure that sensitive data is not compromised. This requires the creation of a specific encryption configuration resource that references an optional encryption provider. It also requires for you to configure the Kube API server with a specific flag to enable, okay? Now, since secrets are encrypted on write, performing an update on a secret will encrypt that content. Now, this is not a standard feature. It's something you would have to set up if you'd like to employ, okay? And as a, you know, a guideline, if you're leveraging encryption of secrets, be mindful of the need for rolling over and or revoking keys for those secrets, okay? And we go to rule-based rule -based access control, or RBAC, okay? This is a method of regulating access to computer or network resources based on the roles of individual subjects. So what's a subject? Oh, subjects are users, groups, and or service accounts, which we use to give pods identities, okay? So RBAC uses roles and cluster roles to represent, represent permissions, uses role bindings and cluster role bindings to grant role permissions to subjects. And 
one thing to note that it does require the API server to be configured to enable, which I believe it is by default. Okay? But if you want to use RBAC, make sure your cluster is configured to enable them. Okay? And this is what you can use to ensure that only authorized subjects can access specific specified resources. Okay? So we just have an example of a pod reader role, and then the binding, which will bind the role to a specific subject. Okay? And in this case, uh, some user by the name of Jane. Finally, that leads us to network policy isolation. Okay? So the idea is, you know, by default, any container can access any container within Kubernetes. That's the guarantee of CNI. But you may not want that. You may want to limit pods within a namespace to be able to hit other pods or, or be hit. Or even, you know, perhaps you want to completely isolate and not allow a pod in one namespace to invoke a pod in another namespace. Network policy isolation is what can be employed to achieve this, okay? So it will enable your pod isolation by explicitly rejecting or allowing connections to from pods and or other network endpoints, okay? So network policies are defined for namespaces and may be applied to multiple namespaces which share the same label. Remember back in the beginning I talked about always label your namespaces? So the idea is that you can have multiple namespaces use the same label, okay? Now, if you want to use network policy isolation, network policies, it requires a network CNI plugin which implements network policies. Calico, WeaveNet, Cilium, th these are some options, there's quite a few more. And these need to be installed and running on all your nodes, okay? Now, defining a network policy will have no effect unless a supported CNI provider is installed and running, okay? And without network policies, pods will accept traffic from any source, including other tenant workloads. So here we have an example, okay? Using a namespace selector. Now, within network policies, you can do it um, based on CIDR block rules, um, labels on pods. In this example, we're actually linking it to a namespace. So the end result and effect that we're going to have is that it's only gonna allow pods with the label role db, database role, to be accessed from other pods in any namespace that contains the label tenant capital one, okay? So that's a good example of why we would want to do that within the namespaces, okay? Finally, leads us to something called open policy agent, or OPA, okay? So all the previous Kubernetes features that we discussed can be used as the ingredients to achieve a well-managed multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. More recently, however, a tool called Open Policy Agent is being leveraged by some companies, like Capital One, for instance, in order to declaratively define policies to provide additional guardrails in order to address things like multi-tenant concerns. OPA can be bundled with enterprise tools that can be used to push OPA based on policies to one or more live Kubernetes clusters. This is very powerful, okay? Even further, the OPA service can be connected to a Kubernetes validation, a validating admission webhook, right? To be able to listen to specific events sourced by the Kubernetes API server and perform things like validation and mutation. Okay, so you know, perhaps maybe you want to employ a policy to disallow any workloads to be deployed that are referencing registries that are defined within a whitelist. So perhaps you know, when a request comes in, if you have a spec referencing uh, a registry that's not supported in that white space, in, in, um, yeah, that's not supported, then perhaps fail the request and not allow it to propagate. This can be all done declaratively using Open Policy Agent. It has um, a specific uh, language called Rego um, that you can use to define all your various rules. Now, I personally have not used 
open policy agent, but I know it's actually very popular. And one of my colleagues at Capital One has written a really cool um, article um, on open, open policy agent where he goes through, and he's done several presentations uh, as well. Um, I can go ahead and bring that up real quick, just so you could see, da, da, da. And there it is, gentleman's name is uh, Jimmy Ray. And adjusting common concerns with DevOps, uh, basically using open policy agent. Okay. So finally, summary and takeaways. So summary and takeaways. Never deploy an image with tag latest, right? How do you roll that back? You'd have to repush the image, the old image, right? Sloppy, uh, definitely not good, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning when your production deployment is not going very well and you need to roll back. You don't want to mess around with things like this. So follow good guidelines, right? Always use a secure image registry. Never deploy a single Kubernetes pod in production. You should always be using your pod controller managers, things like deployments. Okay? Always define liveness and readiness probes for your workloads. Use auto scaling wherever you can. Always use a tenant specific namespace for your workloads. Always define CPU and memory resource requests and limits for your workloads. Set them equal to the workload quality of service class for guaranteed. If you can, if you cannot achieve guaranteed, then try and you know, achieve burstable if you can, OK? Definitely use limit range and resource quota resources to further control resource limits across all workloads in the namespace. If you don't do this, then any pod containers can allocate whatever they want for the most part. And in a multi-tenant environment where you have multiple users competing for resources, that's just not going to scale and it's not going to work. Use taints and affinity to keep workloads away or near nodes and other workloads when isolation is necessary. Okay? Use security context and pod security policies to allow or restrict workloads from using host kernel features. Okay. You run a container as root, it has access to do just about what it would like um, on a worker node, including assuming the network namespace, process space. Okay. So you need to be cautious. Use secrets to help limit exposure to sensitive data. Okay. Don't bake those things directly into your container images. Not very flexible. Use role-based access control for fine-grained access control based on user system roles, okay? Use network policies to allow restrict network access to or from workloads, noting that you must have a network policy supported CNI network provider installed and running. Oops. I went backwards, apologies. Consider leveraging open policy agent for pushing declarative policy updates to your Kubernetes clusters. Now, if the features discussed are not enough to isolate your workloads from other tenants, then perhaps you need to consider using a separate Kubernetes cluster per tenant. Okay? Maybe a shared cluster is not for you. Um, especially difficult are shared clusters where you have stateful workloads. Stateful workloads can get to be much more complex, you know, especially when you have workloads that require volumes to be mounted. Um, of course, you know, the volumes have to exist within, like, within AWS world, like within the same availability zones, or else they won't, the, the servers will not be able to mount those volumes. So really getting stateful increases your complexity. Right? So as a friendly reminder, I will make myself available outside the session room for extended quality questions and answers immediately after the talk for a short while. Okay? My contact information, Paul said with a capital and one, uh, Twitter. Thank you very much. So at this time, I see that we have about five minutes. I can take some questions on stage, and then we'll have to go ahead and move it outside. Okay? Any questions? Question. 
Okay, so the question was, um, when we say shared, how many applications are we talking about? So the thing is, when, when we're talking about shared, really number of applications, I mean, while it is a factor, um, you know, really, it's, it's not the fact of the number, it's the fact that they are disparate workloads, the fact that those workloads are owned by different users. And of course, each user, you know, is going to be looking out for themselves and have their own best interests at heart. Okay, so those are the kinds of, but it's really, you know, multiple users, uh, perhaps, you know, users you're not familiar with work, running workloads. And the bottom line is, you will be competing for resources with all these other tenants, okay? Regardless of the number of workloads that you run. Obviously, you run more workloads, you're going to be consuming more resources, okay? I can. I, I'm sorry, come again? Um, oh, slide number two in the very beginning. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so, um, so with network policies, essentially you will define them within a namespace, okay? Um, but the example that I showed, in addition to applying them to a namespace, what you can do is you can also configure it to look at labels defined in namespaces so that, you know, perhaps you have multiple tenants. Now, a lot of times, typically, that might be a one-for-one -one mapping, but not always. You may have tenants that have multiple namespaces, and they may have, you know, good reason for doing so in such a deployment. Well, for one thing, you want, how do you do multi-tenancy with namespaces? Well, utilize namespaces. Your tenants should be using separate namespaces, okay? Each tenant should have one or more namespaces. Right, so the idea is, by leveraging a network policy provider, you can have it tied back to one or more namespaces so long as they define labels that are being leveraged by the network policy. So that, that's a way to do it, to have it applied to more than one namespace. And then, of course, everything, all the workloads defined within those namespaces, the network policy will be applied to. Okay. And it's not just, you know, um, you know, within namespaces, you could define CIDR blocks, you could just define, you know, any pods with certain labels, perhaps you want to block access, you know, to be able to hit your workloads or for your workloads to be able to hit them. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. So being able to control it at the container level versus at the pod level. So I know that, you know, at the, basically at the pod level, you know, you're going to be working with labels, right? Those are the pods that they're targeting. Um, you know, really, uh, I, I can't think of offhand, you know, targeting at the, at the container level, um, though I know that, you know, security context, there is a lot of options within those to configure, you know, how escalated, you know, what, what type of um, network um, usage that you can use. You know, perhaps you're using inter-process communication between containers that talk directly to each other, as opposed to perhaps using a shared mounted volume to share data between the two of those. So most... No, it, it, it is not. It's not something I've had to consider. Um, okay, so the question was, you know, um, leveraging like a service mesh technology for multi-tenancy and whatnot. Um, so I haven't used a lot of service mesh uh, technologies, um, but really, you know, when, when I look at service meshes, really I look at them as, you know, you're going to be deploying a whole bunch of microservices, services, microservices, and you want to be able to have like a top-level view to be able to control 
those resources. Maybe you want to control deployment, perhaps only to a certain ser to some services and not others. You know, that's one of the things that you're able to do with that. You know, is you can be very granular in controlling exactly how you know service to service communication can work at a, at a level above Kubernetes. Okay, it's basically a higher level, really. Okay. Oh, oh, custom resource definitions. Is that what you mean? Okay, the question was around custom resource definitions. Yes, I mean, you know, the idea is, you know, if you need to create your own custom types to model something, you know, within the bi uh, business domain, you know, perhaps it does make a lot of sense to use your custom resources. Now, of course, when you implement custom resources, you know, without controllers, they're pretty much useless. You know, you can create them, they're committed to etcd, they're stored, but without a controller, you know, backing to do something in response, they're not going to do much at all. But, you know, I, I know a Capital One, we use those heavily as well, you know, to, to model uh, do business domain objects and whatnot. Do, do I, I'm sorry, come again? I don't know too much about software-defined networking, to be honest. We can talk about that off, uh, offline if you'd like, definitely. I'd like to know a little more about that, yeah. Any uh, other questions? Okay, so it looks like we're uh, past time. So I'll be outside the, the session room. Uh, anyone has any additional questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Uh, my contact information is there. And no need, uh, you know, the slides will be posted and available for you to download. All right? Thank you so much.